As the ball dropped on New Year's Eve last year, we had a vision for what 2020 would bring. In a matter of months, that crystal clear 2020 vision had become blurry. As our goals and hopes for the year had to be changed, people started to ask, when will we go back to normal? After all, going back to normal would solve all of our problems, right? But what if normal was broken? Let's start this year by looking at things in our life that we hope don't go back to normal. From faith to finances, from relationships to racial divide. Let's move forward instead of going back to the broken normal. Hey, my name is Josh and I want to welcome you to another study session. If you've been watching along, you know that we're in a series called Renew Normal and we're taking a look at different things in our lives that maybe aren't worth going back to normal. What I mean by that is that in 2020, I, along with a lot of other people, were asking the question, when are we going to go back to normal? Or I just want to go back to a sense of normalcy. But the question is, are those things that we're wanting to go back to actually broken? Is that sense of normalcy that we're wanting to go back to actually flawed and unhealthy? I think there are a lot of things that we need to ask that question of. and. I've looked at things like devotion and anxiety, and today I'm going to look at the idea of hurry. And hurry, I think, is actually different than busyness. Busyness is this kind of season of feeling like we have deadlines or that we have extra responsibilities or, you know, we take on more things than uh, we're accustomed to. But it's this kind of short-lived season that can be managed. Hurry, on the other hand, is just kind of a prolonged, um, incessant feeling of anxiousness, of never having enough time in the day. It never really goes away no matter what you do or what you try to do. So today I'm going to look at three different ways that we might be able to battle this sense of hurry or even to try to remove it from our lives and that we can actually slow down in the midst of that. And we're going to start by kind of setting the tone with a bit of a self-assessment self quiz. So there's seven different words, seven, seven different um, combination of words that I want you to think deeply about, I want you to be honest about and really decide where you are at and just simply answer yes or no. How many yeses did you have from that list? I would argue that five or more are probably something worth looking at three or more probably are worth looking at as well and in particular what did you say yes to because some of these concepts are pretty significant things like isolation or escapist behavior even emotional numbness they are a good indication of how hurried you might feel so again what does it mean to be hurried or what is the definition of hurry Hurry is a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness, an overwhelming and continual sense of urgency. It's a general feeling of always being short on time. And if that weren't enough, here are some statistics to convey just where we were at with this sense of hurry in our lives prior to the pandemic. So pre-COVID statistics showed that 60% of U.S. adults and 74% of parents said they at least sometimes felt too busy to enjoy life. One third of children said they always felt rushed. And we have behaviors that show this sense of hurriness as well, just kind of the constant tug that we have from technology. 
the average smartphone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day. <laughs> and we now spend an average of five hours a day on our phones, checking them once every 12 minutes or about 80 times a day. And we spend just under two hours a day on social media and over four hours a day watching television. Stress is a factor in five out of the six leading causes of death, things such as heart disease and cancer, stroke, and lower respiratory disease. An estimated 75% to 90% of all doctor's visits are for stress-related issues. But here's the thing, the solution for hurry is not to somehow magically add more time to your day. We know that that can't be done, but it's actually choosing to slow down and to simplify our lives, which might be the harder work. So what does it take to slow down? And we're gonna take a look at a pretty well-known story in the Bible. It's of Mary and Martha and their visit with Jesus. It's one that we oftentimes go to when we are feeling this sense of hurry. It's a reminder of what it means for us to slow down and simply sit at the feet of Jesus. But I want to caution us that we don't overly simplify this story and kind of remove the humanity out of it. And what I mean by that is that it's not that Mary was completely right and Martha was completely wrong in their approach, but I think we need to recognize that each of them tried to come at this situation the best way that they knew how. It's that their actions led to a posture in their hearts that was unhealthy, in particular with Martha. And that's something that we can, that we can learn from and, and glean some truth from. But I don't want us to focus so much so on the actions themselves, so much as the result of what those actions created in each of these women, or in this situation in particular. There's a lot of nuance, a lot of layers here, and I think there's a lot of truth to be had regardless of how we look at it. So we're gonna start with Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And in particular, we're gonna start with verses 38 through 40, the first part of 40. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. So already you can see the, the stage is set for some tension and some conflict and I think this is where we can start to, uh, again, pull out some truth for us to learn from. And there, there are three key points that I want us to focus on, and I'm going to go through those here. So starting with the second part of verse 40, she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. So the first key point I want to want to mention is that we need to eliminate distractions. And in order for us to eliminate distractions, we must recognize how comparison is killer. I don't know about you, but I know for me, I so often am influenced by the choices and the actions of the people around me. I take note of what people are doing, what they're saying, how they're choosing to go about their, their lives. Do you find yourself in that same situation where you allow the, the actions and the, the choices of somebody else to greatly influence you? And I think what we need to recognize is that we need to have a strong center for ourselves, a strong foundation that we can draw upon. Otherwise, the things of this world, the distractions that come at us so quickly and so overwhelmingly, they will start to influence us more than we want them to. But if we have that strong foundation, if we have that strong center, we know what is important to us. We understand and recognize what values we have. 
and why we are pursuing those things in our lives. And so what is going on around us becomes less influential. Now I'm not saying that we can't be inspired by what is going on around us to greater things, to even better ways of doing those things, but I think that if we have a strong center, then we can have just kind of a better sense of what it is that we want in our lives, and perhaps even more importantly, what we don't want in our lives. <laughs> the thing about eliminating distractions is that oftentimes we are saying no more than we are saying yes, because we are being very vigilant and very specific about the things that we do allow into our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Dallas Willard says this, Hurry is the greatest enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry. It may sound a bit crass, it may sound a bit harsh, but we have to have that, that mentality, that sensibility, that we are not going to let everything in. And what we do let in will be very specifically what gives us life, what gives us joy, what speaks truth into us. And then we can start to eliminate those distractions. Second key point I want to offer is this, that trust God with the details. Sounds like a Sunday school answer. It sounds perhaps a bit trite, but again, I think so often we overlook this and we so quickly bypass this very important point. We are so eager to take it on for ourselves that we forget that we are asked and encouraged and invited to let God worry about the details. So Luke 10, verse 41, but the Lord said to her, said to Martha, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. Another well-known passage is from Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. So don't worry about these things, all these details, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. We have all these great ideas and thoughts and plans of our own that we forget to entrust God with them and actually to center ourselves in God's plan for us, his purpose for us. I remember seeing this refrigerator magnet once that said, we make plans and God laughs. <laughs> and I think it's easy for us to think of God as kind of this puppet master in the sky who's you know, pulling all the strings. But in fact, I think of him more as this, um, just this father figure who takes great joy in watching the enthusiasm of his children as they run out ahead of him. I think of it with my own kids when we would go on hikes when they were younger and they'd be running out in front of us and they'd be giggling and laughing but eventually they would come back to to us and to me and my wife and ask what direction are we going which way are we going <laughs> i think it's a good reminder for us as well that we can have all the enthusiasm and joy and excitement as we want in the world but if we're not Putting that before God, asking God to take care of the details, there comes a point where we will come to that fork in the road and we won't know which way to go. And ultimately, I think there is always that gap. There is that gap where we are having to take that leap of faith. And we can try to get all the answers that we can, but eventually the way that God would have us go, there, there is a time where we are going to have to make that leap. So the third point I wanna make is that we need to discover the right priorities. And I need to mention that this is something that is just, it's lifelong. Whatever season that we are in, we are always trying to discover the right priorities. And the, the foundation, the basis of those priorities doesn't change, but the priorities themselves may shift, they may be redefined, they may change. 
depending on the season that we're in, and that's okay. Luke 10, 42, we read, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Again, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And the point I want to make here is quite simply that our time is not our own. I think so often we look at our time as something that we want to hold on to, that we want to protect, that we want to keep, that we want to um, stop from um, being abused or used or whatever it might be. But in fact, I think our perspective needs to shift and change. And we need to recognize that our time is not our own. There are two things specifically about that I want to mention. One is that time is a gift from God. Each and every morning when we wake up and take that breath and recognize that we have a new day before us, His mercies are new, His blessings have been showered upon us, and we are given an allotted amount of time to use to glorify His name. But how do you approach the day? Do you feel like this time is yours and yours alone? Or are you able to recognize that it is a gift and it is something that you want to use to reflect God's beauty into the world, to be fully present with people, to be fully present in the moment? I think we tend to look ahead and when we do look behind, we are regretful and wish that we had done more and I think that's because we don't fully take advantage of the present the here and the now our we're distracted we're kind of pulled and we're um, not aware of what's kind of right in front of us and again the many many gifts that God kind of gives us in the midst of that as well he gives us people he puts people in our path. He gives us opportunities to follow his lead. He gives us every opportunity to live out the purpose that he has for us in this life. The second thing I want to say too is that just like finances, time is something that we are to steward. God gives us time as a gift that we are then entrusted with to use well and to use wisely to get the most out of every moment of every day, to love him and to love people in the midst of that. So how are you stewarding your time? How are you using time to glorify God? How are you using it to care for one another and to serve others? John Orperk says this, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. And so that's it. Those are the three key points I wanted to make to talk about hurry and how we might be able to slow down and simplify our lives. Again, those three things are that we can eliminate distractions, we can trust God with the details, and we continually can work to discover the right priorities. How might you do that in your own life? What are the ways that you can start to implement these practices into your day-to-day? Whatever it is, make the decision to commit to those things, especially when times are difficult. And let's not slip back into normal. Let's recognize that normal was broken in a lot of ways. And this is an opportunity for us to reset, 
and to be restored, to finally take stock of our lives and be really diligent about the things that we add into our days and the things that we eliminate and remove. Let's be changed in the midst of this instead of wanting to just simply go back to normal. And I think as a result, we will actually be better because of it. So thank you again for joining me for this study session. I wanna encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can be notified when new study sessions and new videos are posted to our channel. Blessings to you. And I'm so grateful that I have this time. I hope that it's leading to some good conversations. Until we see each other again, take care.